Hello, this is Mr. Fredericks, and today we're going to do a screencast on the 1937 court packing plan, maybe the worst moment that FDR ever had. And of course, FDR is considered by some the greatest American president. So uh, his worst moment is significant. It's a moment where the American people kind of turned away from him. So let's kind of check this out. So that said, we're studying the court packing plan, a little background information, a little context never hurt. So from 1933 to 1937, FDR was a hero. The previous president had done almost nothing to support the American people during this time of need, during the Great Depression, but FDR came in and passed dozens and dozens of laws and pro created programs to help him. People loved FDR, greatest president ever, as far as I'm concerned. Well, in 1937, he's gonna get in a wee bit of trouble and that forward positive momentum, nope, not gonna entirely stop. So this is an example of him losing and missing the mark. Let's find out why. So the United States has three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and judicial. And this was by design. This is called separation of powers. We wanted the power of our government separated into three branches so that no one branch could ever become too powerful. So we even went further and established checks and balances, ways that each branch could stop the other branches of getting too powerful if any of them ever became tyrannical or bad. So those checks and balances are important. So is the separation of powers gig. Well, anyway, one example is on an opening on the Supreme Court. The president gets to pick who is going to be on the Supreme Court. Um, and a lot of times they're going to pick somebody who has similar politics as them that thinks the same way. And that's OK. But the check and balance is that the U.S. Senate gets to either approve or not approve. That prevents a president from picking a really, really bad person to be on the Supreme Court or themselves or their friends. So that's a way, you know, that's the way of giving power to a president, but at the same time, checking it so that he doesn't misuse it. Well, in 1937, FDR made his biggest mistake, and that's going to be the court packing plan. And what, what exactly is court packing? Well, let's dive right into that, right? Um, sorry, I think we have a mm -hmm. well, that is a pretty good understanding of what core packing is that ultimately we're not just replacing people that died or retired on the Supreme Court with people that think like us. We're, um, FDR is going to try to pass a bill to increase the size of the Supreme Court from whatever size it was to a larger size so that he could then add people that think like him and they could take over and dominate the court. And so that's going to be called the court packing plan and the American people are going to hate it. So now why did FDR try to pack the court? Well, in 1929, the Great Depression struck. The American people were suffering and they needed somebody to help them. So FDR got elected by a lot in 1932, and he wants to help the American people. He called his mission to help the American people a mandate, which is a fancy political term that means he has the will of the, of the American people. The people love him so much that Congress should do whatever he wants and pass whatever bills he wants because, it would be, because the American people were behind him. And that was actually true. FDR won that election by so much, he did have a mandate. And he's going to use that mandate to create the New Deal a program where he helped the American people endlessly. Now, who or what stood in FDR's way of helping the American people? Well, it turned out the Supreme Court a little bit. FDR is going to try to pass so many laws to help the American people, but the Supreme Court, with their own power, with their check and balance that they have, they have a check and balance called judicial review. And what judi judicial review is, is a very, very, very powerful power. And it basically allows the Supreme Court and all the courts to look at any law that Congress passes or any action of any president and declare it unconstitutional, that it violates the Constitution, therefore Congress and the president can't do it. It is the most powerful power that anybody in our government has, judicial review. So the Supreme Court was looking at um, things that FDR was doing and saying it violates the Constitution. The government shouldn't be allowed to do this. And they were destroying FDR's programs of the New Deal. FDR's like, I'm trying to help people. What are you doing? Now, particularly, there were four members of the Supreme Court nicknamed the Four Horsemen for their ability to destroy the New Deal. And those four horsemen are going to always vote in a conservative manner and not let FDR and the government be active to help people. So this was one example of one of the laws that was ripped up. Um, FDR passed a Farm Bankruptcy Act that basically was going to help farmers 
not um, when a farmer couldn't pay their mortgage, um, they, you know, this prevented banks for a long time from foreclosing and taking their property and kicking the farmers off. So anyway, um, the Supreme Court's going to get rid of this law saying, no, that's unfair to banks. We're not going to let you do this. So another law was the NIRA, based on the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. It regulated prices that businesses could charge because it was the Great Depression, wages and made them be higher than a lot of businesses wanted them to be, and it regulated hours. And ultimately, uh, that's going to be ripped up by the government because uh, the Supreme Court is going to be like, no, FDR, you can't do, you can't pass laws controlling these things that violates the freedom of businesses. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, that also was ripped up by the Supreme Court. This was a law that basically was paying farmers not to farm, so the price of their goods would go up and farmers wouldn't be stuck in poverty. But that was ripped up. So Roosevelt's getting angry. It wasn't just these three laws, but a lot of laws that he had passed to try to help the American people were now getting declared unconstitutional by the judicial review power of the Supreme Court. So FDR was like, well, what can I do about this? So how did FDR want to protect his New Deal programs from the Supreme Court? He got an idea in 1937 says whenever there's an empty seat on the Supreme Court, the president gets to pick the new person. Well, if I can just get you know these four horsemen to retire, I can replace them with people that like my programs. But the four horsemen weren't retiring. So FDR says, you know what? I'm gonna make my own spots in the Supreme Court. I'm gonna increase the size of the court from nine to 15. And now that means I'm gonna get to pick six people to be on the Supreme Court. And those six people are gonna think just like me because I get to pick them. And now all of a sudden, I control the Supreme Court. They're going to be very pro-New Deal programs. So again, remember, the presidents nominate who gets to fill in the Supreme Court. The U.S. Senate gets to approve. <clears throat> so FDR says, let's create some empty seats. Now, he, uh, back in the day, um, so he tries to pass a law called the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill of 1937. That's a mouthful, right? It basically said, it's basically the core packing plan. It basically said that the Supreme Court is super old and they can't handle enough cases anymore. So what are we going to do? We, um, every Supreme Court member that's 70 years or older, they can't handle it. So, what's, um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're then going to add an extra Supreme Court justice to handle all the work that they themselves can't handle. So in 1937, that meant six justices. Six justices were 70 or older. And that meant FDR got to add six, increasing the size of the Supreme Court from nine to 15. So on March 9th, 1937, he's going to tell the American people that he's doing this on a fireside chat. And the Supreme Court gets angry. They're like, we're not old. I mean, they were. He tells the American people they're old. They're out of touch. They're slow. They can't handle enough cases. They need help. We need to add some extra horses to carry all the cases we need. And I mean, it's true at this point, the Supreme Court actually refused to hear 87% of the cases that you know people wanted them to hear to try to solve, try to help them. So maybe FDR was on to something. They, um, he said they were backlogged, their workload was too much, they were elderly, they couldn't handle it. So anyway, FDR is gonna pass this law and he actually says, you know, we're gonna restore power to the branches. We're gonna give them, we're gonna make them bigger so they can hear more cases. And they'll actually be powerful enough to help this country. Ironically, it's the opposite of what his, his opponent said. All right, let's watch this video. All right, so what was what was that? Oh, I'm sorry, let me move past that again. What was FDR saying? He's saying, you know what? These old justices are holding us back. I know they're, they're crumpy and they think we shouldn't add members. No, we're going to move forward and get a new Supreme Court that's going to allow my programs to exist and that's going to help the American people. So why were so many people upset with FDR's attempt to pack the court? Now, to understand this, you got to go back to 1620. Pilgrims themselves came over from Europe and from 1620 to 1776, America expanded. But the United Kingdom was oppressing us. They owned us, right? So we had an American Revolution, and we kicked them out, and America won. And then in 1787, the Founding Fathers built the United States and the Constitution. But we were so unbelievably fearful of having another Britain, another faraway government, even if it was the U.S. government, telling us what to do and taking our freedom away after we fought that Revolutionary War. 
So we made a government that would prevent that from happening, that had three branches, separation of powers, remember? And in 1937, the American people were like, FDR is violating this, right? So oh, here's a little explanation. So again, people thought that FDR was trying to be too powerful, trying to get a power grab, you know, um, and that's not okay. In our government, we want power shifted around to lots of people, right? Um, move past that for a second. This was an example of FDR slowly moving from a democratic government to taking over one other branch, the Supreme Court, and that makes them look like a dictator. Now you might say, ah, oh, these people are just paranoid. But I would argue that at this time, right across the ocean, Hitler was becoming a dictator. Spain had been taken over by dictatorships, and this was not so unrealistic. The United States could fall. I mean, again, Spain had Francisco Franco, so uh, the Soviet Union had Stalin, and Mussolini had taken over Italy. He got rid of that democracy. Hitler had gotten rid of democracy in Germany. It really wasn't far-fetched to think that FDR could be grabbing this power, and people were freaking out. And FDR said, it's not a big deal. I'm just changing the size of the Supreme Court. It's always changed. In 1789, it had six. In 1801, it had five. In 1802, it had six. In 1807, it had seven. In 1837, it had nine. In 1863, it went up to 10. In 1869, it went back to nine. And then in 1937, you know, FDR was trying to change it again. What's the big deal? But again, everybody thought that FDR was evil, or enough people did anyway, and that the Supreme Court was going to be dominated. So it seemed like a disaster in the making, just like what was going on with Germany over there. So things were about to get ugly. A lot of Republicans and even Democrats were going after FDR to prevent this from happening, but then something happened. Now, what led to many of FDR's supporters changing their mind and actually um, getting, getting rid of this law? Well, here we go. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, keeps wanting to play, which I get. So either way, how did this all get resolved? How did it get resolved? Well, the summary of how the court packing plan got resolved is basically in 1937, um, people, were, I mean, FDR was like, we have to pack the court to save all the American people and let my laws pass. But that was when, a, you know, a switch in time saved the nine. One of those four horsemen switched on a, an important decision, switched sides. And then FDR looked like a fool. It turned out that maybe the Supreme Court didn't look evil after all, that his laws weren't all getting destroyed. And at that point, FDR's initiative to pack the court lost, um, lost some momentum. So again, Justice Owen Roberts, in the very famous West Coast Hotel <clears throat> via Paris case, became more reasonable. He switched sides and allowed a law to exist. So FDR no longer was upset, no longer was pushing the court packing plan, and no longer seemed entirely needed. A stitch in time saves nine. That's the famous expression that basically says if you have a small hole in your shirt, and if you stitch it or sew it really quick, then you're going to save the shirt. If you don't, the hole is just getting bigger and bigger, and you have to throw the shirt away. So a stitch in time saves nine. It basically means be proactive. Solve problems when they're small or they will become bigger. And a playoff of that famous saying is a switch in time saves nine. The Supreme Court was saved when one of them became reasonable and switched sides to the FDR side. Anyway, the outcome of that 
On July 22, 1937, <clears throat> the bill to expand the court was rejected 70 to 20. The legacy of it, number one, was that FDR was humiliated. He looked like a power-grabbing Hitler. And at this point, um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and the opposing senators basically made FDR look bad, and they defeated him. Number two, he lost political capital. Basically, people, if they like you, let you get away with anything. And now people were fearful of FDR, thinking he was another Hitler. So they didn't let him get away with anything anymore. He passed so many bills prior to the court packing plan, and now Congress is going to slow him down and make it hard for him to pass anything. So all of that goodwill, trust, and influence is going to be gone. FDR, um, you know, you could argue he had no more power. He was the greatest president ever, and now maybe not. Number three, in 1938, the midterm elections. What happens is presidents get elected for four years, but halfway through, everybody else gets elected. And you can lose, um, if your political party is in control of the presidency, what can happen is if you're unpopular in the middle of your term, <clears throat> all of the people in your political party in Congress will not get elected. And that means you won't be able to pass laws because you need them to pass the laws. And in that midterm election, the Democrats, for the first time in a while, lost a whole lot of seats in the Senate and in the House. So the New Deal is no longer going to have as many supporters. It's going to be harder to pass bills. Number four, 1937. What happens is one of the justices retires and FDR gets to replace him. In 1938, two other justices die or retire and they get to be replaced. In 1939, two others either retire or die. That's five justices in like two and a half years that died right after the court packing plan. So weirdly enough, FDR didn't even need the court packing plan. He got to pick five new justices and dominate the court anyway. And he could have avoided looking as sketchy and power hungry as he did. So the New Deal in the end actually gets saved. And I think it still ultimately makes FDR seem like the greatest president of all time. And that was the core packing plan and a lot of lessons for us. Um, all right. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy your day.